why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Cliff Lynch. I'm the director of the Coalition for Networked Information, and I'll be introducing and moderating this session. Um, you've reached the final session of the plenary days of the CNI Spring 2021 virtual member meeting. We will be doing a, a one more brief session um, in about 90 minutes, which is really just to uh, bring the meeting to a close, thank a few folks and things like that. But um, this will be a very fitting, I think, conclusion to the meeting because it really does, as so many of the other plenary day sessions, look to the future. Um, and uh, um, I think that's, that's the right way to, to be drawing the meeting to a close. So a couple of things uh, before we get to the panel. Um, this session is being recorded as have all the other sessions for the spring virtual meeting. They will be publicly available after the meeting concludes. Um, you have a chat box and a Q&A tool, and I would invite you to use both of those as the session proceeds if you want to make comments or ask questions. Um, we're going to hear from each of our four speakers, um, and then I will moderate a, a Q&A session, and you can address questions either to the entire panel or to, spe to a specific um, speaker or, or speakers. There is also closed captioning. Please feel free to use that if it's helpful. Um, I think those are all the mechanical things I wanted to say. So let me introduce this panel just briefly. CNI has enjoyed a long and fruitful relationship with the Council on Library and Information Resources um, Clear Fellows Program uh, for many years. Um, Clear um, selects and funds a group of fellows, uh, a cohort every year or so. And uh, they have often come together in conjunction with our meetings, particularly our spring meeting, and uh, have always been um, welcome guests at our meetings when they took place in person. Um, from my perspective, the Clear Fellows are a really important program that brings a whole set of diverse expertise, viewpoints, and talents into our institutions where they do wonderful, creative, and often very unusual work um, for uh, the period of their fellowships. They often then go on to do other fascinating things, and uh, many of them continue to be engaged with um, libraries, with archives, special collections, technology, um, uh, in the service of research and teaching and learning um, in fascinating ways. And uh, many of them have become longstanding members of our community. Now, I know that our member representatives at CNI have always enjoyed the opportunity to get to know the Clear Fellows, the current um, cohort every year um, at the meetings that we held when they were held in person. Um, the Clear Fellows often were very engaged at sessions. They would ask incisive questions and make insightful comments. And um, uh, people would have an opportunity to get to know them a little bit at the social events. Then we went virtual. And 
when we went virtual as a consequence of the pandemic, um, while many of the sort of um, content related and programming related uh, parts of our meetings continued, so much of the interaction, the community building, the getting to know people um, got lost. That's really, really hard to do in the virtual environment. We don't seem to, as a society, have mastered that yet. Um, uh, so starting with the fall um, 2020 CNI meeting, I had been growing very concerned that we had cohorts of clear fellows that were just getting lost to our community that we didn't have an opportunity to get to know. And I suspect that those clear fellows faced a difficult time as well because so much of the, the um, you know, process and the opportunity of being a clear fellow is getting to interact and build that community and those connections. Um, so I, I um, started convening panels um, in December of uh, about four or five uh, clear fellows drawn from recent cadres. And um, we did one focusing on the uh, the 2019-2020 fellows in December. Um, this time we've uh, also brought, um, brought, brought some members of the most current cohort um, to join us. And um, we're certainly gonna continue doing this as long as the Clear Fellows program continues and as long as we're virtual. Um, I'm not sure how we're gonna handle this if we get back in person in the fall and beyond, uh, but we certainly look forward to continuing to welcome the Clear Fellows into the CNI community. So with that introduction, I have four wonderful Clear Fellows to introduce you to today. And um, I've invited each of them to say a little bit about themselves, their background, their work, and also their current concerns and uh, thoughts about the environment we're in. And I've asked each of the um, panelists to talk for around 10 or 11 minutes um, and then uh, as I said, we'll open it up for some questions from the audience. And for want of any better organizing principle, I'm just going to take them in alphabetical order. And uh, I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, our first um, panelist today, Portia Hopkins. Thank you, Dr. Lynch, and thank you, members of CNI, for this opportunity to speak to you today about the exciting work I'm doing at CIRCLE, the Center for Engaged Research and Learning, and the Fondren Library at Rice University. My name is Portia Hopkins, and I'm the CLIR DLF Postdoctoral Research Associate in Data Curation for African American Studies. To give you a little background about me, my training in American studies and historic preservation from the University of Alabama and the University of Maryland College Park, as well as my experience in university special collections and working at the National Archives in Washington, DC, prepared me for this fellowship. But the work that I'm privileged to do now um, to collaborate and lead at Rice University has transformed my scholarship in just one short year. And so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about those experiences today and um, let you know how COVID has also been a part of that narrative. And Diane, if you could put the visual up, be so helpful. Thank you. So what you're seeing here um, are two images. 
the two photos you see offer a snapshot into the vastly different African-American experiences that I'm studying in Fort Bend and Harris counties, um, both in Houston, Texas. They're captured just 50 years and 50 miles apart. And while one reflects the depths of despair, the other reflects the promise of a bright future through home ownership and community building. Both images call into question issues of agency and kinship and belonging and represent the undertold stories that my work seeks to reveal. The Sugarland 95 story map project, as well as Project Pleasantville, are two initiative, initiatives from which I would like to share my experiences today. Um, to give you a little bit of background, when I was awarded this fellowship, I was so excited and humbled um, and honored to start working um, with the Rice community and the community organizations that they partner with. Um, my fellowship started July 1st, and unfortunately, one of our community leaders, um, Mr. Reginald Moore, died just three days after I started. And so I had known Mr. Moore um, from other research opportunities that I had participated in in Fort Bend County, um, a symposium that he had put on in 2018 about convict leasing on Labor Day and was really excited to get the opportunity to work with him again. And so the loss um, triggered something in me as well as many in the Rice community and in Fort Bend County community. Moore was more than just a colleague of mine. He was also an activist um, who had been diligently working for 30 years um, telling the story of least convicts and providing a voice for the voiceless. And Mr. Moore was one of the first people that um, was talking to the Texas legislature, talking to um, historical commissions in Fort Bend County about the bodies that were in the ground that were not marked, that were um, the remains of least convicts. And so after his tragic passing, um, Fondren Library really doubled down on um, honoring his legacy and his life work. We had already had um, a collection of his papers at the Woodson Research Center, and we were really interested in continuing to tell um, the stories of men and women who tirelessly worked and tragically died in the fields, as well as integrating Mr. Moore's activism um, and heroism into those narratives as well. And so from that, um, I partnered with the Convict Lease and Labor Project, or CLIP as we call them, and have started working on a story mapping project. We were fortunate to be able to hire an undergraduate research fellow to assist in some of the technical aspects of this as I am learning myself as well. And um, what I'm most proud of with the work that Suzanne and I have been able to do in just a few short months is reveal some of these stories. And so the image that you're seeing here um, on the left is from 1900 and it's from a sugar farm in Fort Bend County. And in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see Imperial, Texas. And this is from the Imperial Sugar Farm, um, which is, uh, was also the um, convict, uh, the central prison farms convict leased um, private industry that they worked with. Um, What's really fascinating about the story map and um, why I'm so excited to be sharing this project with you is that it continues to evolve and develop. Um, one thing that we're really excited about is pairing this story map with the Black Houston Act, uh, Atlas that one of the faculty members at Rice University is currently putting together. Once the project is finished, um, we envision it combining multimedia and photographs, documents, maps, newspaper clippings, and press releases, um, and deeds to tell the story of um, the Sugarland 95. And this project in, provides such an important layer um, in talking about convict leasing in Texas, which was something that was incredibly prevalent, and unfortunately something that people don't really talk that much about. Um, of late, we've had more discussion around it, but I can tell you going up in K through 12 education in Texas, we I heard nothing of the sort. The second project I wanna tell you about is Project Pleasant, uh, Pleasantville. 
this project began as a class project for two faculty members at Rice University. Um, and they were interested in looking at um, environmental racism and, toxi and toxicity. And so from that project, um, from spring 20, um, COVID hit, of course. And so they had to move the operation online. Well, as, as most things do when we go online, it changes the scope of our project. And so I was ecstatic um, to get an email from my supervisor alerting me of an opportunity to work on this project Pleasantville, particularly bringing in my expertise in oral history um, methods and community activism. Um, and I just, I love this project so much. I've fallen um, so deeply and passionately in love with the story of Pleasantville. And I'm so honored to be the vessel that gets to um, help tell this story. Pleasantville, um, is an African-American community that was founded after World War II in Houston. And it's the direct result of a need um, in Houston that emerged from two different shifts in Houston demography. Uh, the first is the influx of African-Americans moving from rural areas to the city um, between 1930 and 1950. And I have a colleague, Bernadette um, Pruitt, who wrote a fantastic book uh, called The Other Great Migration that kind of points to some of these things. And then the second is um, a need for GIs to find a homestead for their families when they returned from uh, Europe and from abroad. And so you think like these are men that fought so bravely um, that did not experience the same type of racism in Tokyo and um, in Germany that they in France as they did in Houston and they come home to these rural parts of Houston and they say no way I'm coming to the city and so Pleasantville really emerges from those two demographic shifts um, and then of course the GI Bill is going to help this process along coupled with that bill and more specific and more specifically within Pleasantville you're going to start to see this community building that's going to occur um, beginning in 1948. And so the second photo is actually an ad um, for Pleasantville. It's dated September 10th, 1950, and it demonstrates what access to opportunity looked like in the form of property ownership at a time of Jim Crow. Um, now, if you look a little bit closer at this, you see um, they have some luxuries, right? Um, they're stormproof and solid plywood um, building materials where Houston, it floods, we get a lot of hurricanes. So that would definitely be a draw now and even then. Those oversized still windows are gonna let in that um, beautiful spring light and that Texas heat. <laughs> um, but most importantly, the ways in which they're building community and property ownership is going to be central to the experiences of Pleasantville residents. And so the oral histories that I am conducting um, with first and second generation Pleasantville community members really kind of get to the root of what made this community so special. And I can tell you, it has been a challenge with COVID because um, on the one hand, we, we lose something when we're not in person. Um, and I can, I can definitely attest to that um, as, as recent as Tuesday when I got to do my first in-person interview um, and I was just so humbled to be invited to Mr. Moran's home and to be able to do this interview with him, face, socially distanced, of course, but um, face to face. Um, and just, I, I wanted to also point you to just briefly, because I, I know I'm going to run out of time, that the other thing that happens in COVID is that we start to chip away at the communities that we've built. And the thing that I really love about Rice is they're intentional about continuing to build community despite the obstacles that we face with COVID. Um, I'm part of a um, community activist and community archives reading group. Um, I've been able to sit in on instructors lectures and um, help graduate students like revise some of their chapters like I've had so many amazing opportunities that were allotted and afforded to me because of the digital world um, and so there, there are plenty of disadvantages I, I do not want to say that you know the digital world is all amazing <laughs> um, but there there are some advantages to that and I think as scholars we have to continue to find new ways to um, push our scholarship forward. 
and find new ways to ensure that we're not use, losing that collaborative piece. Because one of the best things about being a researcher is being able, being able to create new knowledge from the sources that we find. Um, and the last little piece, I'm currently working with social studies coordinators for Houston ISD and Round Rock ISD to integrate um, the story map into the curricula for the convict leasing. And hopefully when Project Pleasantville gets um, up on its digital feet, we will be able to integrate those narratives as well. So I thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I hope you all stay safe and live well. Thank you so much. That was fascinating and wonderful. Um, Luling, uh, would you uh, tell us about yourself and what you're doing? Sure. Uh, thank you, Cliff. Um, my name is my name is Luling Huang. I'm um, I got my PhD in uh, uh, media and communication from Temple University. Um, I consider myself as uh, quantitative. Um, social scientist. I my research is about um, belief change, um, pub, studying public op opinion, and also uh, persuasion. So my dissertation compare four uh, mathematical models that investigate the, the psychological processes uh, behind people processing uh, a very uh, extreme message. So that is very general about my dissertation. Uh, during my time at Temple University, I got the opportunity to work as a graduate uh, assistant at the Digital Scholarship Center at Temple University Libraries. Uh, I got the opportunity to learn and develop my skills in different uh, methods for digital humanities and computational social science, uh, such as text mining and also um, social network analysis. Um, and also, I just got more um, hands-on um, experience with the, the, the whole life cycle of um, data curation, uh, web scraping, data cleaning, and also um, data analysis. So those are my uh, prior experience before I joined um, CLEAR, the CLEAR program. So right now, I'm a um, um, data curation fellow uh, in energy social sciences at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, my, my position is uh, I'm working like a bridge between the university libraries and the Scott Energy Institute at the Carnegie Mellon U University. Uh, I'm going to talk about several of my projects. Um, these are all uh, on uh, in progress projects because I'm still uh, just uh, seven months in my position. So the first project, uh, a big research project I've been working on is a project about um, energy equity. So relating back to my background in studying public, public opinion, I de developed this project studying, measuring the public's attitudes about the inequality of um, electricity consumption in the US. So actually one third of the, uh, of the households in the US uh, is in the condition of um, energy uh, insecurity, which basically means that people cannot afford their energy bill. So uh, I'm teaming up with uh, an engineering scholar at Carnegie Mellon, uh, Professor Destiny Nak, and also Eswaria Raja, um, the research associate at the Scott Institute. Uh, so we are collaborating together on this um, uh, research project. Basically, it's a, a choice experiment uh, based on um, the behavioral uh, economics literature um, that uh, we are inferring this uh, uh, parameter called inequality aversion based on people's choices between uh, different distributions of electricity consumption. So that's very generally about uh, my, uh, res uh, my research projects. Uh, related to that project, so I've been uh, spending a lot, a lot of time on digging into this uh, uh, data set called uh, Residential Energy Consumption Survey. So this is a reliable uh, national data set collected by the US Energy Information Administration. Um, and this data set includes many variables that are very important to study topics about residential energy behaviors and energy economics in the US, including energy consumption and uh, expenditure by fuel type, uh, residential building characteristics, and also household socioeconomic characteristics. 
So I found two challenges for the public um, to, to use the, the RACS data set because uh, uh, the government agency uh, use uh, the tax money to collect this data set. So I believe that uh, any uh, interested citizen should be um, uh, able and find it accessible to analyze this uh, data set for free. So the first challenge is that um, it takes some time to understand a complex survey design, especially for someone who is not a survey expert. And the second challenge is that EIA explains how to properly, uh, properly analyze the REX data in SAS, but apparently SAS is a proprietary data analysis software. So um, my goal is to write an online tutorial in R that explain um, for any uh, interested uh, public about what uh, data uh, sampling design is uh, in a complex uh, survey design. Uh, and also um, give a step-by-step -step tutorial about how to analyze this uh, data set in R, which is an uh, open source tool. Um, and the other project I've been working on is creating a libguide for um, energy social science. So the library, CMU libraries wants to know uh, just very general what this field is that is called energy social sciences. And the libraries also want to create some, uh, 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 provide some res useful resources for the whole uh, CMU community uh, for both uh, teaching and research. Um, um, another project is, uh, is conducting the research data management survey and interview. So the goal of this project is to, to inform the data services uh, at the CMU libraries to, 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 to better uh, understand the needs and current practices of data, uh, of data management of the, uh, by the energy experts at the Scott Energy uh, Institute. So um, I've been uh, collecting the, the survey uh, responses and also I just uh, finished my first interview with uh, one of the e uh, energy experts. And the last project, um, this, this is about um, to help the, uh, the SCAR Energy Institute to better use uh, one of the resources provided by the library, uh, which is called um, Dimensions. Uh, uh, we can think of it as a, as a newer, uh, a more open source uh, parallel to uh, Google Scholar. So um, the problem um, for the SCAR Energy Institute is that um, they want to track the latest uh, uh, scholarly information, uh, for example, a publication, uh, the latest grants that um, their um, uh, faculty affiliates are getting. So, but they have been doing this manually, uh, keeping track of all of this data in a spreadsheet, which is time consuming and inefficient. So um, I've been uh, working on to develop, a, a first is a backend of data query uh, with Python. Um, to query the uh, dimensions database uh, with the uh, uh, API. Uh, and also the next step is to create a, a dashboard that is uh, user-friendly for the SCAR en uh, Energy Institute staff to use so that they can track their um, faculty uh, affiliates, uh, the latest publication and grants data uh, more easily. Um, so a little bit uh, more about uh, the remote work impact. So, uh, frankly speaking, uh, I've I've just been grateful that I that I have a job under the current tight job market in academia. Uh, I would say it's uh, it's just a, a bit lack of uh, human elements in my interaction with my colleagues. Uh, I just wanted to know more about my colleagues and build more trust. Um, hopefully, the pandemic situation is going to improve for my second year. And also, um, this is my first uh, full-time position. So many of my day-to-day -day work challenges are just because I'm adjusting to a new professional environment from being a grad student. Um, I just want to thank um, CLEAR for the monthly training sessions. For example, the, the project management, management session is, was very helpful. Um, the CLEAR mentorship program, and also my um, CLEAR cohort for the support. Thank you very much, I will stop with that. Well, thank you. What a, what a fascinating range of projects. Um, and, um, you know, I, I do just want to note that CLEAR has 
as I understand it, been um, supporting a couple of fellows specifically in this area around energy um, in the last year or two, which I think is a really, um, really uh, interesting um, multidisciplinary area uh, for them to be uh, supporting work in. Um, Jennifer, could I um, reach out to you? Absolutely. Thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to everyone today. Uh, my name is Jennifer Rust. I uh, go by she, her pronouns. Um, I completed my graduate studies at the College of William and Mary down in uh, Williamsburg, Virginia. Um, I was studying American studies with kind of an emphasis on uh, contemporary American literature and contemporary history. Um, and specifically, my dissertation focused on uh, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, but currently, I am the postdoctoral fellow for the Digital Humanities Network up at the University of Toronto. Um, so a lot of the work I'm doing this year is uh, split between my own research and then responsibilities for the, the DHN, the Digital Humanities Network. Um, so my dissertation was called Insurgents on the Bayou, uh, Hurricane Katrina, Counterterrorism, and Literary Descent on America's Gulf Coast. Um, and this, this project really examined Hurricane Katrina as a crucial moment of social, political, uh, and cultural negotiation uh, between developing counterterror policy in the United States and this uh, public resistance to it. Um, Specifically, I was exploring how post 9-11 governments, you know, from federal, state, local, prioritize the protection of critical infrastructure. So we're talking about you know, nuclear power plants or energy grids, um, banking systems. So they prioritize this critical infrastructure uh, and counterterror, you know, preparedness over, um, you know, more pressing social issues like climate change or the erosion of wetlands or uh, poverty. Um, so in the post-Katrina kind of environment, the way that this emphasis on counterterrorism uh, intersected with American racism was to reinvigorate kind of the anti-Black, anti-Arab uh, racisms that we were seeing, um, you know, throughout American history. And it kind of coalesced at this moment. So in the militarization of New Orleans, we saw afterwards, um, post-Katrina authors and filmmakers were really, you know, exposing and condemning this exercise of uh, counterterror rhetoric um, and also practice by connecting the storm to both, you know, domestic apparatuses of slavery and mass incarceration, but then also drawing kind of these transnational linkages um, to international systems of detention and overseas occupation. So alongside this uh, written project, I designed a digital humanities component that really tried to visualize the more um, you know, theoretical arguments that I was making. Um, so I'm going to drop into chat right now a link to the mapping website that I created. Um, I used HTML and Python uh, and also Leaflet JS to create uh, kind of this multi-layered map that took, um, you know, cross-referenced flood depth and race and class demographics um, with these you know, security checkpoints that were uh, installed in post-Katrina New Orleans, so that we could see very, very clearly, very easily not only the um, historic systems of environmental racism where African-Americans were placed on lower ground while white neighborhoods were on higher ground, um, but also this intersection between race and militarization. Um, quite often the, the bulk of these security checkpoints would be um, you know, distributed in a way that protected white spaces of capital like the French Quarter. So um, again, by integrating these multiple spatial analyses into one visualization, um, the project uh, tried to clarify how strands of American racism, 
and disaster response and counterterrorism were manifesting and overlapping in New Orleans at the time of the storm. So I give this kind of background to what my doctoral research was because my research in, uh, in this postdoc position really builds on that. Um, so I was quite disturbed by what I was finding um, about the domestic uses of counterterrorism against racialized populations. Um, and then under the you know, last administration, um, it really seemed to accelerate and become much more uh, visible. This use of you know, rhetoric that described protesters as terrorists, um, the use of, of mil active duty military or private contractors to shut down protests. So my current research project excavates this integration of war on terror military tactics into policing, immigration, and prosecution um, between Hurricane Katrina, where I left off, and the present day. Um, I'm specifically looking at the use of private security contractors, um, which in, in more of you know, everyday terms, they're mercenaries, right? So they're hired to do this kind of uh, security work outside of the U.S. military complex. Um, so I'm, I'm focused on that and also drone surveillance um, and how these components have infiltrated uh, modes of domestic governance and state institutions. Um, so I've identified kind of three key areas that I want to focus on. Uh, one is disaster response again, because we're seeing the same repetition uh, of what we saw during Katrina in New Orleans in post-Hurricane Maria, Puerto Rico. So again, we see this influx of private security contractors uh, coming in to guard um, you know, spaces of capital, to guard water supplies, um, to the detriment of the, of the community there, and particularly in racialized terms. Um, I'm also uh, honing in on um, protest in the United States, um, specifically the no dackle protests in Standing Rock and the Black Lives Matter protests, um, especially in Portland, where um, the use of private security contractors became like this flashpoint. Um, what's particularly disturbing about the Standing Rock protests is we're seeing kind of this um, it, it, the, the roles of private contractors are bleeding across, you know, what we would consider like legal boundaries. So the state prosecutors in the Dakotas were hiring private security contractors to conduct surveillance um, to create files on protesters that they, the prosecutors, could then use to lodge uh, cases against them. So we're seeing what was a paramilitary uh, system now has infiltrated policing and it is setting up shop in uh, prosecution and legal in the legal realm. Um, and finally, I'll be looking at immigration uh, because under the Trump administration, private security contractors were picking up unaccompanied minors and then transporting them to hotels in what NPR described as a uh, shadow immigration system and then immediately deporting them across the border. So these children never entered or encountered anyone who represented um, the official immigration system. So we're really seeing something that didn't exist before 1996 proliferate across all of these different um, milieus and environments. So again, this research is going to take shape in a uh, you know, textual form, but it's also going to, um, it's ultimately going to be designed to be a digital project that is open to the public and is very, um, you know, reader friendly. I'm going to use Esri story maps uh, to kind of create this broad view of North America um, with all of the different points where we see private security contractors um, you know, being deployed. And then each kind of pin will take you down into a specific project for each location. So one for Portland, one for Standing Rock, one for um, Puerto Rico. 
uh, so that there will be multiple digital projects that ultimately tell this narrative about public resistance to the deployment of private security contractors. Um, so that's my research. Uh, but alongside that, my work for the Digital Humanities Network, um, you know, really, really draws on those skills and the ability to reach out to other DH scholars, uh, both in Canada and the United States. Um, so one of the projects that I've been involved with this year is trying to get a, um, a critical digital humanities initiative started at the University of Toronto. And so what critical DH is, is that part of digital humanities that really focuses on anti-racism, on feminism, um, on queer theory, and uh, you know, anti-colonialism. So it kind of moves away from the the white Eurocentric kind of text analysis and really emphasizes voices from the margins and voices from racialized communities. So we're trying to get that up and running. Uh, I worked on a grant proposal to get funding for the next three years for that project. And I'm happy to say that we were, uh, we were funded, so it's moving ahead. Uh, but now the task is to kind of build that infrastructure uh, behind the initiative to get, you know, a steering committee up um, to to get calls for new positions and new funding out to people. Um, and finally, the other major project that I've been tasked with is creating these uh, monthly, what they're called is uh, lightning lunches. And so they're an hour, hour and 15 minutes where we have a panel very much like this. And um, you know, organized around a digital humanities theme uh, where researchers can explain their research and discuss with the audience, discuss with each other. Um, typically, these had in the past been held in person. Um, and of course, th there would be lunch, right? So um, that has gone away with COVID, which is very sad. Uh, but we, the one positive side is that, um, you know, in, in opening up on Zoom, we've gotten people from all over the world. I mean, Switzerland, the UK, Germany, um, and you know, east to west coasts of Canada and the United States. Um, so we've had really well attended uh, sessions on archiving Black history and culture or Indigenous data studies. So it's it's been really fruitful and very heartening to see how many people are interested in this kind of critical DH term. Um, but again, building off of what uh, you know, Luling was saying, it's very hard to create that kind of interpersonal connection. I mean, people are there, it's wonderful to see, you have an opportunity to network. But once um, you know, once you exit the Zoom meeting, it's anybody's guess if that kind of connection will continue. And I think there's a lot of you know, invisible labor behind that um, in reaching out in, in finding the time or remembering to reach out to someone you met uh, that isn't acknowledged. I mean, a lot of uh, emphasis has gone into saying that, you know, the digital world provides all these new networking opportunities, but there is an effort and a labor that's involved in that um, that's unacknowledged. Uh, and so, Finally, I, I would just like to close saying, um, you know, some of my concerns, again, like Lu Ling, I am so grateful and so privileged to have a job this year. Um, and unlike most of the queer fellows, my position will end in June. Uh, so I am back out on the job market, but it, it's concerning. Um, it's concerning. Even before the pandemic, the job market was tight and, you know, graduating, you know, you kind of approach it with, you know, this optimism that comes with you, but also a healthy dose of, of fear driven by thoughts of unemployment and the financial situation that comes with that. And I have no firm evidence of this, but it seems like the kind of backup positions that an academic could turn to, you know, the so-called alt-act positions have also dried up uh, because they're tied to the university and state and nonprofit funding. Um, so, you know, approaching the job market again, it's, it's, 
terrifying <laughs> a little bit. Um, there is some good news though. I, I have heard reports that hiring freezes are uh, lifting in some areas, but I'm still not optimistic that we'll see the same or a comparable level of opportunity to what was even available a year ago. So I think I'll end with that. Um, thank you again so much for the opportunity to talk today. Uh, I'm really looking forward to any questions in the Q&A. Well, thank you, Jennifer. And finally, I'd like to turn to Sinatra and to hear about her work. Sure, thanks. Um, so a little bit about my background. I attended Florida International University down in Miami. So I got to go to the beach and do homework while I was in graduate school, which was wonderful. Um, I did the uh, global and sociocultural studies with the anthropology track. My department had anthropology, sociology, and geography in it. And so they decided to give us a very fancy name that we have to translate every time we explain. Um, I also got a graduate certificate in African and African diaspora studies. And so I see someone in the chat also went to FIU. Yes, Golden Panthers. Um, and my dissertation looked at the way that Black Greek letter organizations are representations of the various ways to perform Black middle class identities. And so I went to Atlanta Greek Picnic, which is a festival that happened past tense every year in June. I don't know if they're going to come back. I hope so. Um, and uh, members of these Black fraternities and sororities just descend on Atlanta for about a week or so. And we have all these different performances and things. Um, and so I got to be a part of my dissertation. I was on the step team for my sorority as well. And um, in the pilot study and the actual dissertation year, which stress, that's all I can say. Um, and so I was looking at the different tropes that are available to us as Black Greeks and um, the way that we kind of um, pull from them for different purposes at different moments. Um, after that, I started working at the Prince George's African American Museum and Cultural Center in North Brentwood, Maryland. Um, and I also have done some work with the Banneker Douglas Museum in Annapolis, uh, Maryland. So I was firmly planted in the museum world, obviously. And so kind of transitioning into a different area of glam with this postdoc. Now I am at the Philadelphia Museum of Art Library and Archives and the Temple University Libraries, Loretta C. Duckworth Scholars Studio. So many long, long, long titles. And my title is the <laughs> Postdoctoral Fellow in Data Curation for African-American Studies. So there are a couple of different projects I'm working on with these institutions. One is a Wikidata project where I'm researching missing information from the records of Black artists that are in PMA's collection. And then soon I'll be adding on the Charles L. Blocks and Afro-American collection at Temple University as well. Um, so I'm focusing specifically on artists who were born in Philadelphia or lived and worked in Philadelphia. And because of some, um, some the issues with the gender distribution of these artists, I've also decided to focus on all of the Black female artists in PMA's collection at the moment, because they just, I felt like they need a little bit more visibility. Um, and so the, I'll be able to do some data visualizations with that work. And um, we've, we were able to host a Wikidata edit-a-thon that was combined with both institutions. And of course, over Zoom, which I think was a challenge and an opportunity. Um, and then additionally, I am doing some 3D modeling. My goal is to create a, an interactive virtual reality exhibition experience. Um, I have made a 3D model, or I haven't completely made it, I'm still working on furniture, but I've made a 3D model of Harriet's Bookshop, which is a Black woman-owned bookstore in Fishtown in Philadelphia. And so eventually I'll be able to create 3D models of books and artifacts that are in the Blocks and Collection, PMA's collection, and put those into the space. And her space already in, in real life operates kind of like a gallery. It's beautiful inside and she changes up the way that everything is situated in there. It's, it's just amazing. And so I'll just be kind of switching out what she has in there to focus a little bit more on local artists and specifically those that are in those collections. And soon I'll be starting an AR um, project where we'll be doing some photogrammetry of black, of sculpture, sculptures that focus on black folks um, in Philadelphia. I found a list on the Smithsonian's website of 22, I believe. And so there are a few of us at Temple that um, would be able to work on that. So with COVID, um, there have been a few challenges, of course. Uh, one is that 
as soon as I was about to start 3D modeling archival objects from the Bloxham collection, Philadelphia went into its um, late fall lockdown, right? before Thanksgiving. So I had to cancel that. And now I've just kind of reprioritized tasks that don't require any contact with anyone else. So I've been learning Blender and researching art artists and doing a lot of professional development um, on my own, which is kind of isolating. And in the same vein, I'm also unable to become firmly, firmly planted in these institutions. So I started my interview process during the pandemic. I haven't met most of my colleagues in person. Um, I had to regroup once I wasn't able to do the 3D modeling in person. And so I'm on some committees that are cross-departmental at PMA. And I, um, I'm in some working groups at Temple. So I get to work with specific folks a lot, but there's still that lack of like being in the building. I don't know how to get to either place without a GPS still. It's very frustrating. But there have been some opportunities. Um, I've got a lot of technology in my home now that um, I've gotten from Temple and PMA. I've got my own laptop desktop plus two additional laptops, one for each institution. I've got a VR headset. Um, I was able to do a photogrammetry training on Zoom. And like I said before, I'm in those working groups. So anytime I come, in, uh, I come across a, an issue like I recently did, um, I'm able to take that to the working group and kind of get that figured out. And then I also used YouTube to learn how to use Blender and pretty much created all of these 3D models with the help of the internet. Um, I'm also extremely grateful to the Mellon Foundation who extended the fellowship for those of us who are on the African American Studies track. So we have an additional two years. And I just feel like a weight has been lifted from my shoulders as a result of that. Um, and then also the access to virtual meetings, trainings, courses, all of that. I've done a lot of speaking um, opportunities like this one. We did our Wikidata edit-a-thon. I've taken some coding classes. And I also um, just yesterday took the final course for my digital archive specialist certificate through the Society of American Archivists. And now I've got to study for the comprehensive exam, which is fun because I haven't taken a test in such a long time. So <laughs> this will be an interesting experience. Uh, I've also got some projects outside of those um, main um, projects that are associated with my fellowship. One is that I am a co-interviewer along with Portia on the creating access to HBCU Library Alliance archives, needs, capacity, and technical planning project through a partnership between CLEAR and the HBCU Library Alliance. I'm going to drop a link to that in the chat so you can learn more about that. Um, I'm also the second editor on CLEAR's Collaborative Futures project where we're editing, um, um, I won't call them writings because some of them may not necessarily just be like a traditional journal article, but projects that others are doing there collaboratively around our theme of a third library is possible. Um, so look for that, I think at the end of the year. And then I'm also wrapping up a project called Mapping Racism that I've been doing with the Hyattsville Community Development Corporation. And so I am historically contextualizing racially restrictive deed covenants in the property titles of homes in Hyattsville, Maryland. And um, a lot of these covenants are at the individual and subdivision level. And so we've been researching the folks who were responsible for putting that language in there and how that, um, feeds into the larger FHA project of segregation, of residential segregation. Um, and then eventually the Hyattsville CDC is looking to figure out how to remove that language because right now it's unconstitutional, but you never know. So they wanna just kind of figure out what is what would the process be to remove that? And so this is kind of a part of the larger project. And lastly, um, I am uh, Temple is a part of the leading mentorship project that Drexel is hosting, and so we'll be able to get a um, early career librarian, something like that, to work with me on the Wikidata project to get more information on those records and start doing the data visualizations about uh, local Black artists. Um, and I think that's about it. Thank you so much. That's wonderful, by the way, the connect, that you've got the connection there to the leading project. We've been following that work and its predecessor project at CNI for some time. Those were wonderful. Thank you all. Um, we have here 
some extraordinary people doing extraordinary work. Um, <clears throat> we have a comment in um, asking each of you if you could share a link in the chat or um, tell us where you're going to be presenting or publishing your work in the near future um, so that people can find out more about your work and follow it. Um, so I'd be very grateful if you'd uh, pop something in, in the chat um, to help our, our attendees with that. Um, let me open this up for questions um, from our attendees. And there have been a couple of, of wonderful um, uh, points raised in the, in the, con in the um, chat. Uh, I'll just mention one from Gina Sessing, um, where she points out that while the job situation is scary, there's also a sort of a generational change that's in part been triggered by or, or expedited by the pandemic um, uh, with um, a, a generation of people retiring in IT and libraries, and that may open up some additional opportunities um, in the near future. Uh, and and that's, a, that's, I think, an important observation. Um, but let me, let me invite other questions from our, our attendees. Uh, please use either the Q&A tool or the, or the chat. Okay, well, hearing none right now, I'm gonna ask one very quick question while our panelists um, uh, put a few links and um, addresses and things of that nature into the chat um, so that you can follow some of their work. Um, so I, I, I at, at the risk of jinxing, jinxing um, short-term job searches, I'm I'm always curious um, with uh, with um, Clear Fellows. Where do, where do you see yourself ending up five or five or seven years out? Um, what 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 sort of a thing in 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 an ideal world do you see yourself doing? Just, just jump in. Well, I'm so glad you asked that. Um, the first thing would be employed. I would like to be gainfully employed with benefits. That would be very helpful. <laughs> um, but also this opportunity has really opened my eyes to um, different ways that I could apply my PhD, both in private and the public sector. And so, um, and I just, my love of archives and I'm a book nerd, so, um, you know, I would, I would love to end up in a special collection. I would love to um, continue my work with uh, community organizations and um, helping them with their um, archival process and historic preservation processes, but um, mainly like employed, like that would just be fantastic. <laughs> Building off of employed, <laughs> I've thought a lot about what type of institution I would want to work with. Um, prior to working with PMA and Temple, I was at a very small, um, black museum and so now I'm at kind of the exact opposite of that and I it's it's been a very interesting journey as they go on this diversity equity inclusion and access uh, thing where we've got a new office and all of that um, so I think I do kind of miss working in black institutions and I also often think about how the what I'm doing could be shared a little bit more broadly with those smaller institutions that don't have um, maybe the funding or the staffing or anything like that to do these types of projects. So I'd like to eventually find myself back there, but I am open for now because as Portia said, I would like to be gainfully employed with benefits. <laughs> yeah, if I can just jump in. Um, yes. I, I also <laughs> would like to be employed with benefits. Um, but I second Portia uh, saying that, um, you know, this fellowship has really opened my eyes to the different possibilities. You know, going through a PhD program, you're, you know, 
kind of constricted thinking, well, I'll, you know, I'll get a tenure track job. But um, I would also love to, you know, run a DH lab or work with, um, you know, data librarians. And, and DH is spread all over the university. Like it's in history and English and libraries. So like, who knows? Um, but also, I really want to do something. Um, I was feeling this, this was a, a continual conversation um, during my grad program, because when my cohort started, you know, the police had just murdered Michael Brown, and this was a constant theme going through the, um, the program were these police shootings. And so I don't want to be in an ivory tower where I can't engage with what's happening, particularly, um, you know, around my research. It, it's not enough for me to just write it, um, even if it's, you know, for the public and for academia. Uh, so working in a nonprofit or some sort of think tank where there's, you know, activism and advocacy or, or policy, shaping policy, um, you know, to find something that turns your research into something actionable and fulfilling, I think would also be super gratifying to me to be involved with. Uh, yeah, I just want to uh, echo um, all of the above and um, all of you what you just said and, and also definitely I'm expecting uh, myself in uh, uh, maybe a academia setting. Uh, I would be extremely lucky and privileged to, to be at a, maybe a tenure track position. Uh, teaching and doing research that would be um, that would be fantastic but um, but I also enjoy uh, working at a, at a library setting um, just generally um, um, constantly learning and uh, solving problems I think uh, that's what's uh, driving me forward and and also um, echoing a point um, uh, from from Jennifer that I just would like to do more uh, research projects that are more uh, have more uh, practical implications. When I think think back about my dissertation, it's, a, it's, it's been a challenge for for uh, for for general audience to to understand what what I've been doing. So yeah, that's why I I I, I propose this uh, more uh, 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 practical research that has uh, important policy implications about uh, studying uh, energy inequality. So. So yeah, so those are my, are my thoughts about that question. Those are fascinating responses. I thank you for them. We are at time. Um, I just wanna mention that we will extract links from the, the chat here and be sure they go on the session um, page so that uh, people can, can also connect up with your, your work. Um, uh, because um, when we put the video of this out for the public, we won't, it won't have the chat in it. It'll just have the, the video. So we'll get these onto the, um, onto the uh, session page. Thank you, we're, we're past time, but I just wanna take one more minute to thank you all for sharing this wonderful work with us. And I really hope to have an opportunity at some point in the future, perhaps in December, to welcome you all in person to one of our CNI meetings. So thank you again. Thank every thank you all for joining us, and uh, we will be uh, doing the, um, the the meeting close in about uh, twenty five minutes. See some of you there. Thanks. Thank you. That was just great. Many, many thanks. That was Thank fabulous. You. Thanks for the opportunity. It's been fun. Terrific. Really, really wonderful. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for inviting us. Yes, thank you. Hey, cohort, we did awesome. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> and I see Jody is here with us. And thank you, Jody, for your help in making all this happen, as always. Hi, Jody. <laughs> all right. Well, 
have a really good one and thanks again. Please reach out if I can be of any help to any of you. Please stay in touch. Okay. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.